In this video, my colleague Matt Hollington will show us how to build your own custom visual in Power BI using Deneb. It's pretty awesome. Matt will give you the basics, how to do this, how to get started, build a quick visual. And this is part one. So in part two, the next video, Matt will then go into some more advanced features such as conditional formatting and some other elements. All right, let's go. Hey Matt, welcome. Do you want to introduce yourself to folks? Yeah, no worries. So as Matt, I'm a senior analyst at Axis Analytic. I've been there for a few years now, uh, mainly working with clients to help them build just dashboards for their needs um, across various different industries, um, predominantly mining being based in Perth. And what are we talking about today? But today we just want to talk through Deneb, um, which is a custom visual available in Power BI. What's a little bit different about Deneb is it kind of gives you the flexibility and just the ability to be able to create and modify visualizations to your specific needs. Essentially, it gives you full control. Um, so it's a little bit different to other custom visuals in Power BI itself. So you can do fancy things like like we got on the screen here? Yeah, so this is a few examples here. This is from Kerry Colosco's blog. Um, so she has quite a few different examples of what can be achieved using Deneb. Um, so I suppose the variation and just the possibilities are somewhat endless and you can create visualizations that you wouldn't normally see from the standard Power BI visualizations or possibly even from the custom visualizations in the, in the store itself. So awesome. you can see a so bit you're of gonna, variety. You're going to talk us through the end to end of how to get started and what to do? Exactly. Yeah. So we'll just give you maybe a brief overview of what Deneb is, what's involved, um, run through maybe some examples of what can be achieved in a bit more detail. Um, and then we'll actually dive in and, and build a visual from the ground up just to kind of give a sense of, of what's involved and, and how to achieve that. Cool. Go for it. Uh, so what is Deneb? Deneb is a certified custom visual that's available in the App Store Store. And this visual allows you to develop custom visualizations from the ground up using Vega programming languages known as Vega Lite or Vega. The benefits of using Deneb is essentially it gives you the ability to create something that maybe doesn't exist in Power BI or in the custom visuals currently available. It allows you to tailor visualizations to your specific needs. And the, vi the visual itself is free, yeah, Matt? That's correct, yep. So no other licensing or anything like that. You just download it and you're ready to go. Cool. I suppose the limitation of the visual is that there is a bit of a learning curve. So you will need to have some knowledge of Vega Lite and Vega. And at first, it can be a little bit daunting and a little bit overwhelming. But once you kind of get momentum, you'll find that it just really opens up a world of possibilities in terms of what you can develop. So maybe just to run through a couple of examples of what can be achieved with Deneb. Again, we've spoken about some of these visuals that are kind of demonstrated here on Kerry Colosco's blog. Some other ones that, that have been developed previously. So this one here is one that I developed um, based on a video that was published by Daniel Marsh Patrick. This one here actually uses Vega, not Vega Lite. So we can see something a bit different, something you wouldn't see from the standard Power BI visualizations. And it interacts like you would expect from Power BI Visual. So we've got tooltips, clicking on them, you've got your cross filtering enabled. It responds to other filters. So I suppose another example here is something a little different with a Gantt chart developed by someone else, David Batchy, developed this one, and we'll make this available in the, in the description below. But again, it kind of just demonstrates that you can create something that just you wouldn't expect to see in Power BI normally. So maybe just to dive into some of the basics of, of Deneb and how to use it. So if we just navigate to a just a general file, I've staged just some data and some filters. But if we want to actually load the Deneb filter, we first need to go to the App Source Store, which is in this Get More Visuals. And then we can just search for Deneb, and we'll see here. As with any other custom visual, we can just add it. Oh, it's already in this file, so I won't do that. Another good reference source is this download sample. So this has quite a few different examples of Deneb 
and provides a bit more context on some things that you can do and is a good resource. Once you've downloaded it, it'll obviously be available here. So we can add this to our page. So when you first load it, you come to this landing page and it's got some links to the Vega documentation and just general documentation about the visual itself, which are good resources. And we will refer to some of this documentation as we get into the detailed example. In order to access kind of the dinner visual, we first need to add some form of data type. So let's just add region and say actual. Once we've done that, we can then access the ellipses at the top here and then click edit. So we come to this landing page, you can see we've got a couple of options. We've got Vega Lite and Vega, which are the two languages that can be used. And then we've got this third option here to import a template from elsewhere. So just to start with the basic inbuilt templates. So there's a few options here you can see, and you're able just to map your data fields or your measures to these templates. So we'll just take the simple bar chart as an example. So our region and actual amount. And once they're mapped, we can hit this create button down the bottom. So this takes us to the actual navigator itself. So this visual isn't anything special, but we can see that that's been generated for us and the code or the Vega light code in this instance has been created. Just a couple of things in the editor itself. So this spec sheet is the actual code that's driving the visualization and connects our data to it as well. We've got this config tab at the top here, which just essentially is our global format settings. And this is automatically generated on any template you use, including a blank template and kind of speaks to the custom, um, your ability to customize different elements within the sheet itself or the visual itself. And then we've got some general settings, which we'll talk a little bit more as we get into the detail. Some of the buttons that are available. So if we make a change to some of the syntax, we can apply it by just clicking this and we can have this auto apply changes. So as you're updating this, this will continuously update, but it will slow down a little bit as you continue to, to progress through that syntax. This little uh, repair button here will help just identify basic issues in your syntax. So if you're missing a comma or maybe missing a bracket, it'll replace those or identify those to help fix it. But if you've got bigger syntax issues, it's probably not going to detect those. So something not to rely on, but something that can just help find those niggly, annoying little things that you miss along the way. And then lastly, this button up here just helps remap data. So if you incorrectly assigned, say your actual amount, we can just change that mapping and reapply. So other elements in the editor, we've got the visual aspect itself. And then we've got our kind of data set or our data mapping down here, which kind of, among other things, shows us which data or columns or measures that we've mapped to this visual. Of course, that's an example of, of the editor itself. If we want to import something that's previously been developed or someone else has developed a visual that we like, we'll just create a new example here. So again, to access that landing page, we need to map in some data. So I'm going to map in actual and I might just so origin, actual and budget. And we just follow the same pattern we did previously, but this time we're going to refer to import from template. So the template itself needs to be in a JSON format. So I have a template here that I've previously prepared. We can upload and then we come to the same landing page where we require the mapping of our, our columns or our measures. Depending on the template itself, it might provide you some of the description of what it's showing. It might have an example image and it might have some information on the specific attributes as well. So this one here says that it needs to be a string or a text value. So for this one, we'll just map that to region, budgets and now actuals. And then we can click create Cool. So now we have this visual already mapped. We can see all that syntax is already there for us. So essentially we don't need to do anything else. This is ready to go. So we can just go back to our report. Just apply anything that needs to be applied and our visuals there. Now we can see it responds, filters, 
exactly as we would expect from a Power BI visual. We'll put a link to that little JSON code as well to down, for people to download uh, in the description as well. That'd be awesome. Perfect. So now to dive in to actually developing a visual, we will actually recreate this one that I've just put in from the ground up. So what I'll do is I'll just delete this one. And we're just going to bring in another Deneb visual. And I'll just center this. So the data that we'll use for this one will be the same fields, which was region, actual amounts, and budget amount. And again, we'll go to the ellipses to click edit. And we're going to use Vega Light for this example. And we're going to use an empty template. Perfect. So we've got the same structure. Obviously, there's no, not a great deal of syntax available to us because we're going to create that. But if we look at our config, we've got the same settings that have been generated for us. And we can change things like font and size and things like that as we go. And then we at the bottom here, we can see the data that's been mapped. So this data element here essentially is referring to this data set that's been made available down here. And this would be always be generated automatically and it's something you don't want to remove. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to map this data to our axes in the visual. So to do that, we need to use an object called encoding. And then we need to use a semi, sorry, we need to use a colon. And then any, all the properties for encoding need to be wrapped within a curly brace. So if I just enter one opening curly brace and click or hit enter, it'll automatically generate the closing one for me. And the important thing to note is that if it's not the last item, we just need to make sure there's a comma after it. Otherwise, the syntax won't work. So then the coding, we have the two axis references. So we have the X axis and the Within the X, we can access some of the properties. So we can map this to a field. And the field we want to map this to is our actual amount. And then we can define the data type. So there are a number of different data types and the documentation is a good uh, reference point for this. So if I refer to the Vega Light documentation, and go to documentation tab. So under encoding, which is the property we're currently looking at, we can see that there's a property here called type. And this will provide a lot of information about different types and, and whatnot. But there's a good summary down here, just in this section here, which kind of just outlines the ones we're going to use. So quantitative is used for a number, nominal for a string, and temporal for date time. So in our example, we are accessing an actual amount. So we are using a quantitative type. So we can map that. I think the general opinion is that documentation is very good. Yeah, and Would I would agree. agree with that, Matt? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and I'm always referring to it when I'm developing these visuals. So you, you don't have to explicitly define the type. It'll still work without it. But good practice too. And it becomes a little more important when you start accessing some of, say, formatting properties and, and things like that. Um, so good practice just to get it in. So we've got our ax axis mapped. So let's map our Y axis. And we follow the same pattern. So we'll call the field and region this time. And then the type, because this is a string or a text field, we're going to call the nominal type. So now that we've got that, let's apply. So we don't see any visualization at the moment because we haven't actually created a visual element. But the fact that it hasn't errored out suggests that our encoding has been mapped correctly. So now that we have that, we can start creating the visual elements. So we've got this layer object. And essentially, we can just define different visual components that are just layered upon each other to create the visual itself. So to do that within the square brackets, we create a new item which or a new mark, which refers to a visual element, which need to be captured within curly braces themselves. So we'll create a new pair of those. And then we can define mark. 
So there are lots of different marks and marks are the visual components. So if we refer back to the documentation, we can see this object here, mark, and we can see all the visual, I suppose, types that are available to us. So a lot of variation, a lot of opportunities here to, to visualize different things. So the item we're interested in for this one is bar to keep it simple. So the documentation kind of illustrates the structure of the syntax and also shows different properties that are available to be edited for that specific mark. So if we take note of the syntax that's here, we'll follow a very similar pattern. So we can see that we've got the mark and then we want to access, access the type property and we're going to call that bar. So now we've got a visual element and we can see our y and x axes are mapped as we expected and we can see bars, which is similar to the template that we saw earlier. So because the visual we're trying to build had more lines than bars, we can change the height of these. And let's make that to say a three. So we can see now we have more of a line style. And then there's another property called color. And the theme we're going for here is just a gray scale. Perfect. So the second component we want to build was the actual points or the actual circles that we saw. So to create a new element in a similar fashion, we just need to create a new curly brace. And then we just call the mark again and then type. And this time we're going to use something called a circle. Just going to make sure everything is in quotation marks, which I haven't done here. So you can see the circle appears, but it's quite small. So again, if we refer to the documentation and go to the mark section, we look for circle. And then under the properties, we can see there's something called size. So we have the ability to control the size of those circles. So coming back here, we'll do size and let's just do 400 to make them noticeably big. There we go. And then just for consistency, we'll just make that color the same. Okay, so can you add um, data labels onto those as well, Matt? We certainly can, yep. So in a similar pattern, we'll just add a new mark element. So again, we'll call mark, and this time the type will be text. Like so. When we create a text mark, we need to actually define, I suppose, the text that needs to be displayed. So to do that, we need to call the encoding element like we did at the top. It follows the same pattern, but instead of referring to one of the axes, we just refer to the text. And then it follows the same pattern as you'd expect. We can call the field. So we want this to show the actual amount. So if we do that, we can see that they all appear on the visual, but they're just going to appear on the center axe point, the same as the actual circle itself. So we can offset that using a property called X offset. And we put that in the mark component. So if we type in X offset. And this one, we just need to pass in a number. Because oh, we want minus, we'll do positive 35. So now we can see that it's next to the circles, they're offset. And that's dynamic based on the X point. We can also apply some formatting to those texts. So we can define the format type we want to apply. And there's something called PBI format. And that allows us to use some of these hash format strings. Like so. So now we've got a nicely formatted number. So if we were to look at this back in our Power BI dashboard itself, 
we can see that you know, it's filtering as we would expect. But when we click on our points, it's not filtering other visuals. There's no cross filtering. So we actually need to enable that in the visual. So to do that, we just go back into the editor and we come to the settings tab and we just need to ensure that this cross filtering selection is enabled. Once you click that, you may have noticed that the selected column has appeared in our data set. And essentially that just shows, you, shows us which item has been selected when clicked. So if I click on that first point, we can see that's on and the rest are off. And we can see that just moving down as I click on the other points. So because we have this field, we can actually leverage that to create that kind of selected feel, like being able to identify which item has visually been selected. Because you can see here, as I click and you can't tell which one I've clicked on. So to do that, we go back to our encoding section and there's a property called opacity. And if I set this value to one, it means that there is zero transparency on these items. You can see that's become a bit more solid in its color. But again, we can, there's no dynamic selection, opacity or transparency. So to do that, we need to create a calculation. But to do that, there's a, there's a couple of different ways this can be approached. But what I find maybe the easiest to read is we can access something called transform and transform essentially allows us to create different calculations um, that we can leverage throughout our visual. So the transform needs to be contained within square brackets, similar to the layer level. And then each calculation within the transform needs to be wrapped in a curly brace. So there is good documentation on what can be achieved in this transform component. So if you go to the section here, transform, you've got all these functions that are available to kind of manipulate data and do things as you need. The one we're going to use in this example is something called calculate. So we can see it provides us how the syntax should look and it kind of lists the properties that we need to leverage and define. You can see that both of these are required. So the first calculate, which needs to be in a string, so it needs to be wrapped in double quotation marks, is the actual expression itself. And the as property is just the label name. So if we follow that pattern, we first call the calculate, and we need to make sure they're in double quotations because as defined by the documentation. So in order to access the columns in our data set, we need to call something called datum first. And then after datum, we can use square brackets and single quotation marks. And then we can actually just call the column reference. So this time we're actually gonna leverage a selected item and that's a double underscore on either side of selected. So now we can say does selected and then we can say does it equal? So we use a double equal sign and we wanna know if it equals off. And we need to put off in single quotation marks because it's a string with inside our double quotation marks. So this will return a true or false value. So after the statement, we put a question mark to determine whether this is true or false. So we want to say if it's, if the selected item is off, we want to have it at 70% transparency, which equates to 30% opacity. Otherwise, and we put a, put a colon in there, we want it to be 0% transparent, we want it to be 100% opacity, which is a one, if that makes sense and I haven't lost you. So after our calculation, we need to define the name using the as property. So we'll just call this maybe our opacity level. Cool, so we'll just hit our apply button and this hasn't errored out so that suggests that this calculation is working. So now that we've got our opacity property down here, we can actually leverage an expression. So we need to wrap this in a curly brace and we call this expression property, which is EXPR. And then we can refer to this calculation we've created. So it needs to be within a string. And because this calculation is within our data set, we need to refer to datum again. And then we can just call this like so. 
You may have noticed that when you use datum, I initially use square brackets and single quotations. If you don't have any spaces in your column reference, you can just use a dot to make it a little cleaner, something just to be aware of. So now if I apply that, we can see that the other ones have become more transparent and our region five has been selected. So if I go to region one, we can see we can navigate through that. So if I go back to our visual, we can see that we can see what's selected and it seems to be filtering our data as we would expect. All right, so that's the basics. Matt, that's where sort of people get started with a sort of visual they're familiar with. So in the next video, we're gonna take it up a notch. So what we're gonna cover off. Yep, so in the next video, we'll cover off more the dynamic formatting, how to add some of this conditional formatting to some of the marks that we've created. We'll layer some additional marks themselves. So we'll add the budget components and we'll use this kind of dotted line to show unspent budget amount as well. A little link will pop up to the next video if, if, or if we're watching it, you know, we'll, we'll tune in again next week and uh, yeah, we'll catch you in the next video. Thanks for that, Matt. Great. Thank you.